All right, I'm just going to use the slides here. OK. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning to hear about some of the latest advances in Neutron uh, capabilities, specifically the uh, new pluggable IPAM features. Uh, my name is Chris Marino, and today I'm going to be talking about some of the experiences that we had developing an IPAM uh, driver. And uh, my colleague Robert Starmer will show a live demonstration of it actually in action with uh, OpenStack and, and uh, running Kubernetes on top of it. So you'll see some really uh, advanced uh, features being taken advantage of by the new pluggable IPAM uh, functions. Uh, I expect to talk for about maybe 20 or 25 minutes, then I'll pass it over to Robert. He'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on a demo, and uh, we should have uh, five or 10 minutes at the end for questions. So um, hopefully we'll get through that without too much trouble. And uh, first let me apologize, there's some bugs in this <laughs> presentation. Some of the addresses in the routes that I'm going to show are not correct. I sent Robert the wrong PowerPoint this morning. so we're. Uh, suffering from a little fat-fingered uh, email this morning. Uh, so I apologize for that, but I can, when I post the slides, you'll get the accurate uh, slides. Okay, so let's start with a little history and a little context of what OpenStack was like before pluggable IPAM. You probably know when you started a machine, you'd pick a network, you'd add a segment, you'd pick the CIDR and so forth. You could specify a gateway, and you'd launch, and shazam, it would all come up. And you know that workflow was kind of complicated. It uh, was good for people that wanted to live in a little sandbox, but once you once you needed access to uh, the the public internet or existing data center VLAN or existing IP address, sort of that whole workflow really got disrupted. You had to do cr crazy things. You had to coordinate with your data center to get a VLAN ID or an IP address or some other crazy thing. So. Um, there were lots of issues and limitations with the way IP addresses were assigned in, uh, in, in OpenStack and Neutron, and uh, most people recognized this early on, and it was something that was deferred time and time again because it turned out to be actually a much bigger problem than people uh, had hoped. Um, but the problems that they wanted to solve, I've, li I've listed here. So uh, with this manual workflow, there were lots of errors. It was subject to uh, you know, uh, uh, misconfiguration of uh, uh, addresses and uh, gateways, duplicate IPs. Integration with uh, existing enterprise uh, IPAM systems was really not possible. So all these things were sort of looming and were the, really the motivation for uh, enhancing the uh, address management capabilities. So uh, there was a pretty widespread agreement on that, but the question was how to go about doing it. So you had this, the problem was that the old approach was this big blob of monolithic code that was part of the Neutron database uh, driver, and it did this all uh, in um, uh, one bit of code that needed to be teased out and refactored to allow a pluggable architecture. So that was not a, a, a small amount of work, and it took actually probably two or three uh, uh, design cycles before it, it actually uh, was completed. But the objective was clearly to separate the IPAM functionality out of the original Neutron database driver to allow and enable pluggable backends. And uh, just to be perfectly clear here, I was not responsible, Robert and my team was not responsible for the actual development of the new pluggable IPAM features in Neutron. We just built a, a driver that took advantage of it. It was actually John Belomarek and some of the other Neutron developers that really did all the heavy lifting here. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not taking any credit for what they've done, but certainly I'm uh, taking advantage of the, of the hard work that they did over many, uh, many design cycles. So if we dig in a little bit deeper here, I think you can uh, maybe see a little bit more clearly why uh, the new uh, pluggable IPAM approach is, uh, is quite a bit more complicated. What you see on the left was, is the old way IP addresses were allocated to virtual machines as they uh, were launched. So Neutron uh, had a database plugin. It would make a request, uh, Neutron um, would uh, make a request to the database plugin to create a port. And then the smoke would cluster and there would be a big cloud of dust and then a port would appear with an IP address and that was pretty much uh, all that happened, it was pretty much a black box. So in order to tease out, as I said, uh, the uh, specific functions to uh, make a request to an external system, they really had to do uh, complete re-engineering re 
of that database plugin. And what you see on the right hand side is the sequencing that takes place when a port is now created in Neutron. So it begins with the plugin making a, a, a request to create a new port. That goes to this new database plugin, the new Neutron database plugin, which now begins a set of subsequences to either create a new subnet as required or allocate an IP that would then uh, uh, make a request to the new uh, IPAM subnet uh, module, which ultimately uh, makes a call to the external third-party developed uh, pluggable IPAM driver. Now, that uh, pluggable IPAM uh, uh, module you see there on the uh, second from the uh, second from the right, that's the bit of code that my team wrote. Uh, and then we plug that into uh, Neutron. It's a Python module that gets called in this, in this manner. Once that driver gets called, it can make an external request to uh, a, a, a third-party IPAM uh, system. It responds, and then that rolls back up, ultimately responding with the port and the IP address to the Neutron plugin, and then everything proceeds as, uh, as it did. So uh, as you can see, quite a bit more complicated, quite a bit more engineering, quite a bit more testing. And uh, that was um, uh, first released in the uh, Neutron Liberty cycle. So that is just a, an overview of the scope of work that needed to, uh, uh, to occur. And then, as you can see here, a typical deployment would uh, uh, look something like this, where you would have your standard ML2 driver uh, and uh, the existing uh, IPAM, or now the default IPAM pluggable driver that lives in Neutron. And uh, if there's no external IPAM, uh, it all behaves just as it did before. It all, it's all self-contained to Neutron. But if you choose to uh, customize that pluggable IPAM driver inside of Neutron, what it's going to do is fetch a, um, an IP address from some external system that is uh, defined and described in, in the driver itself. So that's the way uh, a pluggable IPAM system would be um, deployed into into Neutron, okay? Um, so I sort of began my presentation by talking about you know, some of the problems with uh, the existing monolithic database, uh, uh, Neutron database uh, driver and the limitations of IPAM. Now that we have the uh, pluggable IPAM features, uh, people can integrate it much more tightly into their existing enterprise architecture, with their existing data center infrastructure, including their IPAM and their uh, data center VLANs and network management systems and all that other stuff. So in terms of enterprise deployments, it really does streamline a lot of the hurdles that, were, that made it a lot more difficult to deploy OpenStack in a, a traditional data center environment. So that's, uh, uh, again, the, kind of the primary motivation that was coming from a lot of OpenStack's largest c customers that were deploying it uh, inside of their private data center. So uh, that's what it does. And uh, what at this point, I'm going to... Uh, shift here slightly to talk about a very specific example of using the pluggable IPAM features in a, in a manner that's slightly different than the one I just described in the sense of deploying into existing enterprise um, uh, I, I, uh, uh, IPAM systems. Because now that Neutron has the ability to intelligently select the IP addresses however you see fit, that actually represents an opportunity to do some very innovative and creative things. And uh, that's actually what I'm going to talk about a little bit more as the case study for using IPAM in Neutron. And then I'm going to let Robert show you actually it all working in, uh, in a live demo. So um, uh, as I said, uh, the pluggable IPAM allows you to integrate with much more intelligent IP address management systems. And uh, specifically, what I've been working on is an open source project called Romana that is an attempt to simplify cloud, OpenStack, and container networking by using intelligent IP address management to enable complete layer three networks, completely routed layer three networks to eliminate overlays, run directly on the physical infrastructure to increase visibility and increase performance. And the key to doing that is assigning the IP addresses in a way that conforms to the routing infrastructure that's in place. So IP address management was vital to the success of this uh, Romana project. And I'd like to uh, go through a couple of uh, uh, examples of how uh, that's going to work. And also, another uh, important uh, 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 capability of this uh, approach is that it works universally for any IP address and networked endpoint, whether that be 
a virtual machine or whether it be an interface on that virtual machine or whether it be a container running on that virtual machine, it really makes no difference. All it needs to do is issue an IP address. The problem then is uh, 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 delegated to configuring the routing infrastructure to reach those particular endpoints. So the nice thing about this IP address management approach is that it collapses the container networking problem to be just a simple networking problem. And you'll see an example of how that works in just a second. So I talked about the Romana project. It's a network automation and security solution. And again, it enables pure, pure layer three based approach to networking for virtual machines and containers. And it captures uh, both a tenancy model and a uh, isolation model as well as a network uh, policy enforcement model all at layer three. And again, it, uh, it uh, um, allows you to take advantage of very familiar and standard hierarchical routed access designs in your data center. So it all uh, is able to work very seamlessly what, with what people are already building out with spine leaf uh, uh, data center uh, network designs. So again, what uh, Romana will do is uh, uh, apply this um, uh, layer three model uh, assign the IP addresses, uh, configure the routes so they're all reachable, and then apply the security policies to maintain that isolation and segmentation uh, at layer three. Now, the great thing about this is that you don't need an overlay. Everything can be done with the physical infrastructure. All you need is layer three routing, and that has been proven by some of the largest data center operators in the world to be the most reliable, most easy to bug, uh, most scalable way. So um, let's, uh, I talked about the uh, nested endpoints. And uh, again, this would not work without IPAM. So uh, uh, without the pluggable approach to Neutron, Romana would be dead in its tracks. So these two things are completely uh, um, uh, dependent on, I'm sorry, Romana is completely dependent upon the IPAM capability of Neutron. But that's not the only thing it needs because that's just one side of the coin, as I said. Assigning the IP address is important, but if you don't configure the routes, you're just going to have black hole traffic. So you have to not only uh, choose uh, the IP addresses, you have to configure the routes so that the addresses are actually re reachable. And uh, so that's what Romana is. It's actually these, both of these things together. It's intelligent IP address management plus automated route control and configuration. So now let's talk, go back to that earlier example. How am I doing on time? No, not 10 minutes. Okay. Um, uh, here's that uh, diagram once again showing where uh, Romana would uh, appear at the back end. And what you see there in the middle, the IPAM driver is the code that we wrote, coming back to the uh, uh, pluggable architecture. So that driver is really quite simple. Uh, I think in our case, it's probably less than 500 lines of code, probably a lot less, probably cl uh, close to two, uh, 200 lines of code, because really all it needs to do is... Um, uh, uh, issue a request, well, so when Neutron uh, makes a request for a port, all the information that Romana needs is readily available. So really it just packages that up and ships it out over to the Romana um, uh, IPAM module and then the, the uh, response is uh, the IP address itself. So the way we uh, organize these IP addresses is by project and segment and endpoint. And so when a user um, uh, in a, a specific project in OpenStack creates a virtual machine. This request comes down to our IPAM uh, driver and uh, we can very easily identify which project is uh, making the request to launch the, the virtual machine. We know which segment the uh, user is asking this endpoint to be a uh, part of. And um, we know the, um, what else, I'm missing something. Uh, um, drawing a blank here, but <laughs> so the, uh, those, uh, that information is packaged up and it's uh, put in a uh, call out to the uh, IPAM, uh, uh, Romana IPAM uh, module in the back end, and then it's uh, uh, replied with the actual IP address and then everything else is normal. So as, as, as compared to the example I showed you earlier, it's, uh, it's identical. Uh, you have an ML2 driver. There's an IPAM pluggable driver that talks to the external um, IPAM module in, in, uh, in Romana. But in order to uh, configure the routes on the host, uh, we don't use any layer two. There's no layer two agent. There's no bridging. There's just routing that's done in the Linux kernel. So we have an agent that runs locally to the uh, nodes themselves. 
Um, but uh, that's how we uh, get access to IP tables to configure the uh, uh, particular rules. Okay, and here's a little snippet of the, uh, the JSON that would be put in the post that gets uh, pushed out uh, by the pluggable driver to the Romana uh, IPAM um, listener to uh, get the actual IP address. So it, as, a, as you can see here, what, what we provide is the tenant ID, oh, the host ID, of course, I know that, <laughs> drawing a blank. We have to know what host the endpoint is going to launch on because that's where the route needs to send the traffic to. So uh, Neutron knows uh, the user, the segment, and the host that Nova is going to schedule it to. It packages that up in this little bit of JSON, push, pushes it out to the uh, Romana uh, IPAM, and it responds with the actual IP address, and then Neutron launches that, uh, that endpoint. So let's work through a very specific example. Now, this is just one example. All these things are configurable. You can go in and change this however you want. But what you see here is a uh, v4 32-bit address. And this example is using a full 10 slash 8 network, which leaves us with 24 bits that we can use to embed information about the tenant, the segment, the host, and so forth, and the endpoint. And that's exactly what Romana do, does. So in this particular example, for simplicity, so you can actually see the addresses and make logical sense of it all, we said we're going to just identify eight bits to identify the host that the virtual machine is actually running on. We're going to identify eight bits for the ten tenant and segment that the endpoint is on. And then the final eight bits are actually going to be the endpoints themselves. So what that actually means is that for every host, every physical host, it is going to have a physical network CIDR, a 10 slash 16, because you're going to get the 10 slash 8 plus the 8 bits of the host is going to give you a 10 slash 16. So in these examples, when you see the gateway on the host, it's all going to have a 10 slash 16 address. And that is statically configured. It's, static, it's configured by Romana, but it's statically configured and is not dependent upon the IP addresses that come up. And the IPAM is going to know which hosts have which routes and it's going to choose the uh, address to maintain that route hierarchy. So the only thing that needs to happen when a, uh, an endpoint is launched is that the interface needs to come up. You don't have to do route distribution. You don't have to do tunnel uh, um, uh, endpoint. Uh, what's the uh, Mac, uh, uh, Mac uh, population? What are they? Population? I don't know. There's something with Mac drivers. Mac addresses they pushed out for various places. You don't have to do any of that because the routes are statically configured and the IP addresses are assigned intelligently to maintain and conform to that static addressing. So 8 bits for the host, 8 bits for the tenant segment, and 8 bits for the, for the endpoint. And what that means is you've got longer ciders depending on where you are in the hierarchy. You've got a 10 slash 16 for the host, a 10 slash 24 for the segment, and then 8 bits for the actual endpoint IDs. So I've beaten that to, to death here, but here's a, a, a very uh, uh, vivid graphical example of what I was just describing. So you see on each host, and you're going to see this live. I've got three physical hosts out uh, in a little uh, garage somewhere. Uh, and they're sitting on a, actually a switch network, a 192 network. And um, we brought up a bunch of virtual machines. And Romana has assigned IP addresses and configured uh, gateways and routes, as you see here. So as I said, there's a gateway on each of these hosts. Uh, to a 10.1/16, a 10.2, and a 10.3.16, which means that every endpoint that Nova launches, OpenStack launches on those hosts, is going to live within that network. So all the virtual machines there, virtual machine, oh, they're all labeled one. That's one of my problems in my PowerPoint. Uh, uh, they're all labeled virtual uh, VM1, but they should be different uh, numbers there. But you can see they all have the top uh, 16 bits. The same is because they live on that same network. And then as you go deeper into the CIDR, the 10.1.1 the, the is a different tenant than 10.1.2. And this is the way we maintain uh, isolation and tenancy. And then we apply IP table rules to maintain that isolation. And then the last octet, the 22, 33, 44, that's just the last eight bits. That's the endpoint ID that comes up. So Romana chooses that IP address uh, when it knows the host, and it knows the segment, and it knows the, the tenant. And as I said, it brings up that endpoint, so it maintains that uh, route hierarchy. And you can see on the bottom the routes that are added by the Romana route controller to uh, build in that reachability. And again, that's done. You notice that the, uh, the route is uh, to a, a slash 16. 
So again, as I, just to reiterate, when a new endpoint comes up, nothing else has to change. You don't, there's no BGP, there's no XMPP, there's no VRFs, there's no tunnels, there's no VTEPs. All that stuff just dissolves away. So, um, and as you probably know, uh, this is a uh, crazy tr packet trombone path that goes through a virtual router in OpenStack. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the details there, but uh, you can see how this is getting end capped and decapped, goes to Tor, across the data center, back and forth. It's really quite, uh, um, quite remarkable. Um, but all that goes away because it's not a DVR, but it acts just like a DVR because you're routing. You know exactly the destination for the endpoint, which means that from the target, I'm sorry, from the, from the source of the destination, it just goes directly. Uh, you might have uh, uh, routers in your, in your uh, data center, but nevertheless, this bypasses all that um, uh, uh, packet processing. And the result is you know, just an incredible improvement in latency. Uh, calls out all that stuff disappears, and uh, you can look at this data later. So um, what I'd like to also uh, conclude on is taking this approach the next level of detail, because everything I've said so far applies equally to containers that would be launched inside of a virtual machine. And you've probably heard a lot about uh, K uh, Kubernetes uh, this week at the show. Uh, it's uh, gotten tremendous interest and attention in its ability to uh, capture uh, you know, very uh, simple and successful application deployment patterns. And uh, what, what, uh, the, the point here is that um, each of the Kubernetes pods gets its own IP address. So what we can do is take this exact same intelligent IP address management approach and apply it to the Kubernetes environment that's running inside of OpenStack and use that intelligent IP address assignment to uh, assign IP addresses to pods that conform to this hierarchy. So again, this exact, all the things that I've been talking about happen again within a virtual machine directly to pods. What that simply means is that I have, in this particular example, just for clarity, uh, we've set up the network for the Kubernetes environment to be another separate network, a 172.16.12. Uh, and again, all the same, the methodology uh, is consistent. We have a host segment. I'm sorry, a host field, a segment field, and an endpoint field. And that provides you with various ciders into the various pods themselves, which results in this. OK, so now we'll take those exact same examples. I'm sorry, there might be some typos in these numbers, but uh, the um, uh, version I will send out is accurate. The point here is that you can see that when Kubernetes launches a pod in one of these VMs, it can make a request to the Romana IPAM to issue an IP address on that virtual machine, on that host, that maintains the route hierarchy. So everything, is st everything can work as, uh, as I, I just described it a moment ago. So again, example, we have that first bit to identify the host. But in this case, the host is a virtual machine. So what that means is we've got, uh, for these pods, we have uh, uh, a 72.16 address, a .17 address, and a .18 address. And then from there, we have the two, uh, th the next 16 bits to identify, again, a segment and an endpoint identifier, just like we did in OpenStack. But in this case, it could be applied to pods that could be isolated by segment or project or whatever isolation mechanism is appropriate. So again, this is uh, 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 a new way of thinking about OpenStack networking, it avoids the overlays, it avoids the complexity of encapsulation, reclaims the performance, transparency, but it also carries forward naturally into these new container environments. And again, it's all enabled by uh, the new pluggable IPAM features in, in, uh, in Neutron. So again, this will work on a switched or a routed network because uh, in this particular example, all these hosts know about each other so they can reach the gate point, gateway quite easily. But that could just as easily be in a spine leaf um, routed a design where you just put the routes in the, uh, in the tour. Uh, and exactly, that's exactly what uh, we're working on. So these, these routes that you see on the host, they could just as easily be living in the tour. No, that would actually would just, the work is really the same. It's just some question of where you, where are you pushing those routes, up to the tour or down, down onto the host. And then last but not least, before I pass it over to Robert here, is that everything I've said here about 
IP addresses and hosts and reachability exists across the WAN as well. So there's a project in Kubernetes called Ubernetes, and this is an approach that allows Kubernetes to schedule pods and resources across separate data centers. And uh, everything I've said works uh, identically to an environment where Kubernetes is running across uh, data centers. And uh, actually, I was hoping to get the demo where we could actually have two OpenStack clusters with Kubernetes scheduling across them, across them, and that would have worked. We wouldn't have had to change anything, but just time didn't allow us to, to get that done. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Robert. I think he should have still have time to get uh, through the demo. And uh, I'll uh, let uh, Robert pick it up from here. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple different things. I'm going to do a little bit within the OpenStack environment, and we're going to look at the addresses that are going to get assigned to VMs in two different tenants. Um, and then we're going to look at what's happening in a Kubernetes environment where there's a little demo script that's basically constantly cycling VMs, giving them new addresses. Both of these services are leveraging the IPAM interface to allocate IP addresses. And that's really the, the big sort of value add of, from having that IP interface, but also the, the, the capability that we can then create from that um, with, within, this, uh, within this environment. Um, so, you know, we can start with the simplest view of things, uh, OpenStack environment. Uh, you can see in this particular case the, the host bits, as, as Chris was saying here, our host bits are 10. Actually, let me make this a little bit bigger so you can actually see it. Um, made it too big. Uh, the host bit is this, the second octet, so we have uh, three different target hosts, so our, our compute nodes, three different compute nodes, uh, two, zero, and one. Uh, in this case, there were three nodes that were spun up for Kubernetes environment, um, and these are then the IP addresses of the VMs that the Kubernetes environment then lays on top of yet another network, the, the 172 network that Chris was talking about, um, for Kubernetes uh, components within that. Um, I spun up another machine in this particular pod. Uh, it got another address. Uh, again, because it's in the ten uh, or the, the in this particular tenant's environment, uh, we get the, the host bit, we get the tenant and segment, which is in this case basically combined into a tenant or project, um, and then a new address from the IPAM addressing space of that particular targeted host. That allows us to connect all these pieces together. Uh, if we then jump into somewhere where we can actually run something. Uh, so here, for example, um, make sure we have our environment sourced. So it's simplest, same machines, right? Um, and then we can uh, boot something. Uh, actually, let's 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 do that. let's let's cheat. I'll just use the the the, uh, the easy interface. We'll use the easy button. So we can go ahead and launch um, Summit nodes. Launch two or three of them. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and launch these. It's using the, the Romana network, which is the network that was created for this particular tenant. These guys will launch, they'll build, right? So IPAM already returned an address and a port, uh, so now Nova is able to actually pass that back to, uh, or Neutron is able to pass that back to Nova. Everything here is running. Can you Great. Go to the curvature page? Go to the curvature page. Just so uh, sure. There you go. Top topology, here. right. So, Great, looks, looks just like any other network segment environment that you would expect. Um, if we go to another project, right, so this is the other half of this is we have other projects. Here we have no instances deployed. Um, we can do the same thing, launch some instances. I'll call this same sort of thing. Let's do a couple. And here we also have a network called Romana but it's a different tenant's network. And so the IP addressing will actually show that uh, once we actually get some systems spun up. And so here, the third octet, which is, again, a combined segment and tenant ID is 16 instead of 32. So that puts us in a different space. These guys are segregated from the demo two machines. Right? So that's the basics of, of the IPAM function. Now, on top of this, as I said, we've layered um, a, a little Kubernetes project. 
Uh, this is basically running a loop in the background where it's creating a set of containers, basically two containers. Uh, it scales them up from two containers to four containers, and then it rolls them over to four different containers. And basically, the, the, while well, the container is doing is serving an image. Right? So a very simple little demonstration. Um, we can go and look at the Kubernetes dashboard. So it loads. Hello. Yeah, and here we can see, now again, this is a different address domain so that we could actually keep the two, d two systems separate. You could actually probably even combine them at some point. I think that's something yeah, you guys are absolutely. working on, right? Um, but, but the address space is what's providing that segregation. There is no additional tunneling going on here. This is basically just dropping this onto the same L2 segment that everybody else is living on, just using different addresses to sep separate these, these different resources. Um, and over time, this does actually change as the, I guess I have to refresh it. Rob, why don't you describe the, the actual Kubernetes demo, the, the rolling upgrade yeah. logic? Oh, yeah, so, so what's happening, so for example, now we're down to one machine in the Kitty uh, domain, uh, and we would have a couple more domain, a couple more machines in the um, Nautilus domain, although this keeps changing, so <laughs> um, it's constantly moving. But again, same, same sort of address replication thing. We spun up three VMs to run our Kubernetes uh, environment. Right, so there, there's one master Kubernetes machine with the minion running on it and two more machines running minions. And they have the different, the same uh, sort of second octet is, is doing that host level segregation. So in this case, it's VM level segregation, but it does the same thing in terms of the, the actual routing on the wire. And then of course, the last IP, the last octet is then the actual target pod. So the pod gets its IP uh, and that's what we're then seeing here. Um, and these will keep changing as the system deletes and recreates them. So this is constantly updating. And again, what's making all this possible is the Ramana IPAM integration that sits all the way down at the OpenStack layer to make all these, all these addresses get, get delivered. Right? So that was the demonstration. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's great timing. So we've got a few more minutes for, for questions. So um, why don't we open up the mics and uh, I'll answer as best I can. Yeah, right here in the front. Um, how does that Could you scale go to the microphone? For, how does that scale for like an ISP level? I mean, it seems a great idea to sacrifice, you know, some of your IP addressing to to have, you know, these hosts and but it seems like you're limiting yourself to two fifty six, you know, point. You can yeah. shift where that IP yeah. address shift happens. But it's a good it's a fair point, and yeah. let me speak to that a little more directly. What so, was the question? The question was, uh, with um, uh, a V4 address, are you limiting yourself in terms of scale and capacity for an ISP? Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. Like separate to like right. Give you some like right. And you go back to like where the like music was created. Right. So it's a legitimate question, and there's some trade-offs being made here very vividly. There's no layer two. There's no uh, live migration. But a 10 slash 8 will give you 16 million endpoints. And you can smooth them around and push them however you wish. The example here of 8 bits for host was completely arbitrary for this, because logically, I want to see the number when I'm debugging. But you could change that number. But you should really think about it in terms of 16 million endpoints carved up however you like. But nevertheless, 16 million may not be enough for some users, in which case we do have a way in which we could either NATS between two of these things or V6, which would basically blow that you know, uh, limit to, uh, to infinity. Yeah, we have a, a, list, a, a line of uh, questions up here, so go ahead on the left. Um, yeah, first of all, I love IPAM, and I think it's great. Um, but I want to also uh, comment about the scaling issue. Um, so do you think? Uh, for this, uh, to solve that, and also the mobility also to be integrate like protocols uh, running from the host, so you'll be able to like advertise slash 32 routes? Yeah, um, well, well, two things. Um, uh, the latest OpenStack survey showed that like 90% of all deployments are less than 100 hosts. So while the limitation is real and it exists, I believe for the overwhelming number of OpenStack deployments, they're not going to reach that 
uh, limit anytime soon. So I just want to ma ma emphasize that point. Now, with respect to your, the protocol issue, I'm not exactly sure I understand, but certainly this would work with, with slash 32s. Uh, th there's a, uh, so uh, I'm not sure. The, the point is the, the, the mobility issue. Ah, mo oh, yes, exactly, yes. So if you, we're actually, that's on our roadmap already. So if you do want to support VM migration, you can indeed support it with injecting host routes. Absolutely right. So that's on our roadmap. We do actually do plan to do that. I invite this open source so you guys can help, you can do it yourself. But absolutely right. So yes. Preaching the choir. I'm totally with you. Well, there's, there's another aspect to that whole scale question, too, right? If you look at the average size of a manageable OpenStack component, a cluster, a cell, depending on how you actually architect your, your, your sort of services deployment, uh, you're looking at 100 to 200 machines. So, you know, static uh, slash 32 host routes for migration is something that can actually be done within that scale. Right? And if, even if you do massive oversubscription, you're usually talking about 100 VMs on 100 physical machines. So 1,000, maybe at the extreme end, 10,000 endpoints that you're looking at in a domain. Right? Let me give you an example. We're not this, we have 40,000. Right. So great. So that's 10 times the system. Yep. We have uh, three more questions here. Yeah. Uh, happy to talk to you out offline. I'm Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I, great presentation. I, I'm not sure if I missed this. What, how are you guys doing um, north-south? Are you just relying on the upstream router to, um, to NAT for you yeah. in this? Well, in this particular case, we NAT on every host, uh, okay. just be, for, our, for our little demo. But um, uh, conceptually, we would just rely upon OpenStack standard NATing. Okay. There's still a lot of loose, uh, you know, loose ends to, to wrap up here before. We're still at only version 8, point eight. Point eight. So. <laughs> Okay, good deal, thanks. Sure. Um, how do you deal with metadata? Wh which metadata? Um, all the cloud image, they have the metadata, cloud image. Um, so I that, that would actually fit right under, the, you could use the config drive options or you can still tie into some of the routed or forwarded metadata. You're still getting a DHCP response to the endpoint, right? So I, machines I know, still get the DHCP. Some, so in, in your case, you have to terminate the, T, uh, the TCP connection at the router, but no router can do that. Mm. No, so no, the just... metadata request is a uh, HTTP request to one six nine two four five two five four. Yeah, so, so there are other ways of setting up metadata forwarding. So if you still want to use metadata service, you would either have to inject into a DHCP message, which is part of what OpenStack does mm -hmm. or can do, mm -hmm. or use config drive, which would be the other option. Well, I think metadata works fine anyway. I mean, yeah, there, there are multiple options for metadata, right? Is basically do a DNAT to wherever your metadata server is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but you still need to append all the tenant information in that request, don't you? You still need to somewhere to append all the tenant information well, to your request. No, you don't, because we don't have open app address space. So therefore, you can identify the uh, source of the address just from the source IP address. Oh, yeah. I see. So it makes it work fine. Cool. Right, thank okay. you. Better than I could have answered it. <laughs> Hi, I I'm Sridhar Venkat from IBM. Um, I like IPAM modules, well architected. But can you talk about DNS configuration using IPAM? DNS mask uh, configuration? Oh, DNS configuration as in like tying to designate or yeah. what have you? Yeah. So, so look, no. you're still getting a neutron port and IP address pair yes. associated okay. with then a Nova instance. Yeah. Right? So you have the, the, the you know, the data the, you need. The, yeah. You have the data. Um, designate can take that data and push it into, into DNS, or you can manually enter it your, yourself, right? So all the information still stays, stays the same. Okay. Um, you know, even the floating IP mechanism within Neutron, so if you have a centralized Neutron router, that can work in almost the same way here, right? You can basically okay. do a NAT from the routed space instead of an L2 space. Yeah, because I see uh, IPAM and Designate are two parallel architectures. So my next question was, which is better, IPAM or Designate? I don't know that one's better than the other. In okay. this case, look, we're, we're, we're leveraging, the, the Romana project is leveraging IPAM okay. as a way of allocating addresses in a very specific order. Sure. Right? So IPAM mechanism makes this possible. Yes. Okay. Right? Uh, you could also just say randomly allocate any address, 
Sure. Right? You still have a question then of how you do security and segregation. We're doing it by actually using IP tables and bits within the, the, the IP sure. address sure. to do that segregation. Okay. Right? And then DNS is then a second question. That's more of how do I actually find that device that I exactly. created, right? Exactly. So I think both are needed. Right. Both are equal in my mind. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And I think we have time for one more question. Actually, I think you touched on my question. I, uh, what was uh, my question is uh, what is the advantage in security? I think. Uh, so, so the advantage, I don't know. I mean, we're still we're still leveraging in this in this project. We're leveraging IP tables as a way of providing security and segregation. Right? There's an agent that configures that. That's also uh, configuring the routing and forwarding technology. So we're doing the same thing. We're touching the the packet only once by doing both security and forwarding. So maybe it's a little bit more efficient in this particular model? Well, I'll also add that you can also apply whatever existing layer three security mechanisms you have in place. They all just work. They will draft behind this entire approach. If you wanted to put a bump in the wire and route all this through some other external layer three device, we just ch change these routes to not point to the next host, but to your security device. So basically, the ability to change the next top router is a unique ability to steer this traffic directly where you need it to be. And that is sort of one of the biggest you know, levers you have with security, right? getting it to where you want it to be. And I, oh, I have one more question. Oh, yeah. So, so how are you driving the IP table rules? What Neutron API, is that security groups? Or is it uh, based on the router creation and attaching the networks? So what's, what, what yeah. is the API that's actually driving these IP table configurations? Oh, ending on a tough one, huh? So our agent that I described is we, do, we apply that directly using our own little policy, um, uh, um, uh, I don't say language, but it's a policy, um, drawing a blank on the word. Uh, so, so we don't use um, uh, OpenStax security groups uh, right now. We apply the IP tables orthogonal and out of band. We're working on sort of getting that into uh, the security groups model. We're, we're, building, we're, we're building our policy model independent of whether this be deployed on Kubernetes or OpenStack or Mesosphere. And we have to sort of steer this into uh, you know, behind their approaches. But that's not done yet. So I mean, right now, the mechanism driver creates IP tables and routes relative to the forwarding path and the security that comes from that forwarding path. Uh, I don't think we're currently automating the deployment of the extra little network segment that uh, like Linux Bridge or OVS uses to, to drive security on a device by device basis. Isn't that right? I think so, yes. Yeah. So I mean, this, this is the ML2 config, right? So there's an ML2 plugin and an IPAM plugin. There's, there's two pieces that tie together to make the Romana routed environment work. Right. I think I, I, what I understood was basically you're driving through the agent, um, which is not driven through the API, but out of band, you're actually finding out if these two IP addresses can communicate, and then you enable the IP table to do that. Yeah, and, and that's actually built. I mean, if you think about it from the perspective of a tenant, it lives within a specific set of bits within the IP address range. Right. When I allocate an IP address, I already have defined the security uh, access credential effectively right. for right. that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much.